Hey guys, what's up? Murder here, and Ruby Volume 3 Episode 3 was a fantastic and exciting episode. Exposition, the introduction of Crow and Winter, awesome fight between the two. We got to see a lot between them. Uh, we got to see a little bit more exposition in terms of what Crow's been up to and uh, what Cinder's plans are going into the tournament with the next matchup. So... Starting off, I want to talk a little bit about Winter, and a little bit alluding to my live reaction, if any of you guys saw it. I kind of jumped the gun with Winter. Um, I was really taken aback by her demeanor and how she kind of expressed herself to both her sister and Ruby. And, you know, I, this could be me just being sensitive about it, but, you know, I saw Winter as, you know, very authoritative, very uptight, kind of almost like a reflection of Volume 1 Weiss. And I guess that would kind of make sense of why Weiss was like that. Maybe she wants to follow in the footsteps of her sister in terms of how she behaves and things of that nature. But, um, you know, it shows that Weiss has a very high admiration and affection for her sister. Being really excited to see her after, you know, however long they've been apart. And, you know, her sister didn't really reciprocate any type of affection in the same respect. Now, I understand she's of military, you know, status, and she has to have that type of harsh, stoic demeanor to her, you know, for her position. But still, you know, like, come on. You know, she's talking about, oh, you missed your strikes during the match. Uh, uh, you know, he's like, everything's classified, yada, yada, yada. And then snubbing Ruby, like, oh, you're underwhelming. You know, I'm just like, why are you so judgmental? You know what I mean? Like, not everyone's perfect. And I can kind of see why Weiss was trying to attain that in Volume 1, because it's like... You know, her family and her sister, you know, they probably just all project that type of image of perfection and, uh, you know, high morality and stuff like that. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. But I kind of want to give her more of a chance of really seeing what she's all about. Because through those moments that I mentioned, we did see a bit of her that really cares for her sister and wants what's best for her. You know, she's like, how have you been? She kind of smacked her too. Like, hey, I didn't ask you about your grades. How have you been? Um, you know, she's like, are you eating? Are you making friends? So she's kind of taken interest in what her sister's been up to. Uh, and hopefully with the next episode or however many episodes that Winter's going to be around, we get to see a little bit more interaction for the sister-sister bonding. Um, so aside from the tough love of Winter and Weiss, we got to see my dude, the hype man, Drunkle Crow, come through. And this guy, man, he's been eluded. He's been teased so bad. Volume 1 of he, my teacher's at Signal. He taught me how to use a scythe. Volume 2 of coming to the rescue of Yang during her backstory. And now he's finally here. Voiced by Vic Bignana. Does a fantastic job of portraying Crow. I couldn't have asked for a better voice actor. And I love this guy. I love Crow. Like, he's just a loose cannon. Doesn't give a damn. Drunkle Crow. And... It's just awesome to see him finally here. Now, the thing I will say is I hate how Rooster Teeth has teased this man up to this point. And then the next thing that we want to see from him, especially since a battle, we want to see his scythe, we want to see his weapon of flavor, and they tease that so bad. So bad. I was, oh, I wanted to break something when I, oh my gosh, that was insane. But I'm trying to keep my composure here. We got introduced to Crow. And he's loose cannon, doesn't give a flying flip what anybody says. He's going to say what he wants. He's going to say what he wants. He's going to do what he wants. And he kind of played Winter like a fiddle. You know what I mean? Like, he was just ringing it in on her, like, pushing all of her buttons, getting her really pissed off. And I don't know about any of you guys, but I felt a type of... I felt a type of bad romance vibe, like an ex-relationship between these two. In the sense that Crow was just able to push her buttons like he knew what it was that was going to take the right words to say that would piss her off and just get her to make the first move and then from her uh you know from winter's words too like i don't have time for your immature games and then she was like what were you thinking he was drunk and stuff like that almost like she's kind of had to deal with it i don't know I'm, I'm stretching here but i really would love I would really love it to know that, you know, Winter took an interest in the adult, mature, badass, reckless crow, and, you know, she kind of suppressed him or kept him in check with how authoritative she was in the past. I just think that would be pretty awesome, or maybe just the fact that she kind of had a thing for him over time. Um, but that's just the vibes that I had. Maybe that they them two had a relationship or had something going on. But Crow comes through, talks a lot of crap about Atlas, about Ironwood turning their back on Ozpin, being a bunch of sellouts, all that stuff. And that breaks out into a freaking fight. Amazing animation, amazing choreography. And 
I got to give it up to Rooster Teeth. They outdid themselves. And uh, this is one of my favorite episodes for the exposition that we got, for the fighting scene that we got, from just expressing a lot of what they can do now that they're at the helm. And, you know, that no long Monty, you know, with Monty no longer with it, there's still the integrity is there, and the action's there, and the feelings are there, and the excitement and drive is there. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, so the fighting scene was amazing. We got to see. Huntsman up against Spec Ops and, uh, you know, getting a little bit into it, like Crow, his weapon, for example, it's a three-part weapon. I think it's four parts, I'm not sure, but it's a sword in its sealed form, which is what he used for the majority of the fight. And then it's a shotgun as well, which I was wondering, I was like, okay, he has a sword out, like when I did my initial reaction to the trailer. I was like, he has a sword and it's also a, a scythe. But what effect of a gun it is it? You know, every gun, every weapon's also a gun in the series, and Ruby's is a sniper, so I think that's a pretty cool take that his is a shotgun, while, uh, you know, Ruby kind of diverged from that, like, kind of in the same aspect. Like, I'm going to make a weapon after my uncle's weapon, but I'm going to make it different. So I think that was pretty awesome that it's a shotgun, has a lot of range, and, um... I think his weapon is based off of, if any, if any of you guys know the fighting game Blaze Blue, uh, it's based off of um, Dragna the Blood Edge. He has a weapon that's called the Blood Scythe, and in its sealed form, it's a it's a large sword, almost similar to Crow's sword, but its awakened form is a scythe, and it kind of goes through the effects of changing as you fight with it, and I think that's the same thing, I think that's what Crow's weapon is alluded to, uh, or inspired by, rather. Um... On top of that, uh, I don't know if any of you guys noticed this. I mentioned it in my reaction, but he did like a hair flip when the match started. And I think that was like a, a reference to Devil May Cry because there's a character, Virgil, Dante's twin brother in Devil May Cry 3. Whenever he fights or whenever he's shown up or whatever, he does like the hair flip because they're twins. So I guess in a way to tell them two apart, he does that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's Virgil from Devil May Cry. I thought that was so freaking awesome. So the fighting, choreography is awesome. These two are... I wouldn't say evenly matched, but I will say that I feel like both of them were holding back. We didn't see any crazy type of semblance usage, but we did see a little bit from both sides. Crow wasn't using his scythe. I'm pretty sure Winter wasn't giving her all as well, even though it seemed like they were both trying to fucking kill each other, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But one thing I want to talk about is the semblances in particular. I think this episode confirms that semblances are hereditary because Weiss uses glyphs. And we saw that Winter uses glyphs. She used the glyph to bounce off to avoid um, to avoid Crow's counterattack, which Crow's counterattack also kind of resembles that of Yang's semblance, which would make sense because that's her blood uncle, and her mother is Crow's sister. So it's kind of like a lineage between the two. And uh, Raven has red eyes, which is where Yang gets them from. I guess she has purple eyes from her dad, maybe. But um. I think that's what it alludes to, because Crow, the one hit, he actually got hit once in the fight, was he got hit in the back of the head, he turns around, his eye gives off like a red glowing flare, and then he automatically gets all this power and creates a big crater. So I think that's kind of like the counter um, type of mechanic that's used like with White, uh, I'm sorry, that's used with Yang when she gets hit a certain amount of times and she turns that into her power. Um, but I think it's like a strand of the lineage between them two. So I think that's the same thing. If that is, it's kind of underwhelming because of the fact of that's his semblance. And we know what it is now. And it's nothing grander or anything more on a higher scale. Maybe it is, you know, because that was just like a smack in the back of the head. So maybe if it was something more deadly or more uh, fatally injured, you know, like Yang went through like pillars and stuff like that when she got hit by the paladin. So... Uh, maybe there's different tiers of, of pain to returning on, uh, you know, to, for your return on investment. So, um, like I mentioned, she uses glyphs, but her glyphs are used kind of differently. Like, she used that one glyph at the end for her final strike to get, a, like, she propelled herself forward to use the final strike. But I don't know if this was a glyph usage or a semblance or a completely different thing, but she used, like, a summoning of some sort, and she formed, like, these birds that came out of, like, a channeled, um, glyph in the ground, and it, like, attacked them to, you know, she used them to attack Crow, and I'm like, just looking at Winter, I can only imagine how Weiss is going to develop as the series goes on, and I'm just thinking that she, again, is in many ways a reflection of what Winter is capable of becoming, so I'm thinking, like, if that is based on semblance, 
is Weiss going to be able to learn how to summon? Is she going to have her own summon? Is she going to be able to use that same particular summon? Or even if it is a summon, I have no idea what the hell it was because those birds were like whitened and they were like poofing as they reached Crow and like as they were damaging him and stuff. So I don't really know what that was. If that was like a projection of her aura or, so or her aura or something. But it was fucking, it was really, really, really cool to see. Um, and I'm wondering if there's more to it, like I mentioned. Like if there's, if that's like a higher tier of assemblance or a higher tier of Winter's aura usage. And another thing too, um, because I also thought that that was her semblance as well. I was like, that can't be her semblance because her semblance is glyphs. I'm wondering if characters can have more than one semblance. Like if they can have a semblance from both sides of the family, like one from the mother, one from the father, or if they can develop multiple semblances over time, or even if with dust, uh, yeah, dust augmentation. So that's just something I'm wondering. Let me know if you guys have any speculations on that in particular. But, um... Oh man, dude, this fight was incredible. We saw uh, Winter is a dual wielder. She uses a sword in one hand, which encased in that sword is a rapier, which I guess is in another way why why Weiss uses a dust rapier. It's a different type of type of rapier, but it's a rapier nonetheless. Fencing is kind of like a high class type of spectacle sport, um, and you know they're of a a renowned family, so I wouldn't. So it's obvious that you know they'd be taking fencing and piano lessons and all this other type of high society stuff so um that was pretty cool she used that kind of more towards the middle of the fight which when she was kind of i guess i'm assuming under pressure or when she really wanted to kick up kick things up a notch and then like i mentioned the bird summoning was pretty interesting i'm wondering if they're going to explain that hopefully they do because it's like come on i want to find out more but um following that fight uh, Ironwood came through. Penny was there too. I was real. I was more excited to see Penny. I was like, screw everybody else. We saw Ozpin finally. You know, three episodes into the new volume, we saw Ozpin. Galinda cleaning up everyone's dirty work. I, I felt so bad. I'm like, oh my gosh, this lady's gonna get so tired of her job of cleaning up after everything. A food fight, a breaking of Grimm in the city, and now a fight in the courtyard and stuff like that. Um, and then we also saw the interaction between Ruby and Crow. Now let me say, Ruby was 100% influenced by Crow in her in her youth. I, it, it shows, you know what I mean? She has that reckless type of impulsive demeanor to her. She has that naivety of her. And, you know, she uses the same type of weapon. And her design kind of too. She rocks the red and black. Crow kind of rocks like the dark gray and red. Um, they both have capes. Whereas I feel more Ruby's cape is maybe like a memento of her mother's. Because she wears it all the time. The only time she doesn't wear it is when she's in her PJs or something like that. But even in her school uniform and her regular uniform in her alternate uniform in volume two she's always rocking the cape but i think it's still cool that you can kind of take that, those similarities like they both have capes they both use scythes uh you know what i mean they're both scythe lords uh, eventually we'll see crow uh down the line use that but again penny was there and we haven't seen penny since volume two it's really awesome to see her you know just give her a little wave to ruby she's so adorable but um I'm assuming she's, obviously she's there for the tournament, she mentioned in Volume 2 she's going to be in for the tournament, she wants to test herself, see her capabilities, all that stuff, but I'm wondering if she's also there because Ironwood wants her there on standby in case anything goes crazy, you know, she was with Ironwood, so it's kind of like he's keeping tabs on her, and from Volume 2, I think it was Ironwood that said that he doesn't want her talking to, like, anybody on Team Ruby or anyone in general, like, like, stay close to me and keep your mouth shut, um... So, there's that. I also want to see if we're going to ever see her dad, because her dad's obviously alluded, uh, reference to, excuse me, Geppetto, because she's a reference from Pinocchio and her father made her, so I, I just want to really see her dad, see what he's all about. But the interaction between Ruby and Crow was awesome, you know, they were giving each other shit, she was like, oh, did you miss me? He's like, no, what the hell? And then just fist bumping, oh, I just loved that so much, and I did a live reaction to it, like, that scene was so fucking sick, it was so awesome. But... Getting further towards the end of the episode, we get into the nitty gritty, you know, what Crow's been up to, why he's been MIA this whole time, and he's kind of a recon guy. He's tracked Cinder, I'm assuming Cinder, uh, Emerald and Mercury, back to uh, Beacon uh, for whatever they did outside of the kingdom. And that's another thing. Um, during the fight between Crow and Winter, 
Mercury showed up and he reacted like, holy shit, this guy's here. And he went and reported back to Cinder. So I don't know if they had a run-in with him in the past, one of them, because he was like, yo, this is the guy. Like, what do we do now? This guy's here. And Cinder's like, we stay the course. He doesn't know who we are. So it's like, if they, he doesn't know who you are, then what's the point of being so fearful of his presence? Unless he's renowned enough and he's a known huntsman by his, his look, his weapon, uh, his name you know, any, any of these things, uh, to where maybe he could be the monkey wrench in their plans and maybe he'll be able to be more perceptive of, hey, maybe we need to look out for these people or who are these people from again and do some research on them. So that's the main thing. Uh, also, you know, they went into a little bit of talks of Ironwood and how he's handling this situation of this crazy army. And another thing that's brought up uh, is a girl named, oh, not a girl, I'm assuming it's a girl, but a person named Autumn. He said that the infiltrator, a la Cinder, is responsible for Autumn's condition. So this tells me that Cinder has been, she's got a, she's got a track record, you know what I mean? She's, she's moving from place to place, she's making all of these contingency plans or furthering of plans, and that's the most frustrating part of all of this, of Ruby. It's like, we get the excitement of, this, of the fighting, we get new characters, we get to break down all of this awesome stuff, but we get more questions than answers when it comes to Cinder, like, what is her plan, you know what I mean? Because... She wants the Grimm involved, and the Grimm attack humans and all of their creations and all this stuff, and they're going to cause chaos and pandemonium, and that's only going to lead to more Grimm coming through. She wants the White Fang involved in all this, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, at what point do you think you're going to be safe from all of this? You know what I mean? Like, unless you're able to control the Grimm somehow, or unless your boss or whoever you're following, you know, whoever's the grandmaster behind this, because I really feel like while, while Cinder may think that she's the queen and she's making, and everyone else is her pawn, I feel like maybe she is a pawn in someone's bigger plans, uh, or in someone's bigger game, rather. But yeah, so they mentioned she's responsible for autumn they mentioned sh the the infiltrators responsible for autumn's condition so i'm wondering if this autumn person fought cinder in the past uh this condition maybe being in critical state or comatose or something like that uh don't really have much information to go off of from there um and then they mention again he's like when he's talking to ironwood he's like i've seen the things she's created and they are fear and that just that just brings it's like okay because now, like, I'm getting, like, brain fatigue. Like, my brain is itching to know more. Like, she's, the things she's created are fear. And you got to remember, too, these, you know, Cinder and them have stole the freaking paladins, those giant mechs, you know, these this state-of-the-art, high-tech Atlas weaponry. And if you're creating things that uh, that are fear incarnate, why the hell do you need to steal those things? And if you're creating, creating you know, creating monsters, creating weapons of destruction, uh, you know, with dust and all this other stuff. I just, I really don't know. You know, I can't line the pieces up of, you know, all these context clues of fighting someone named Autumn and putting her in a, sp uh, putting them in a particular condition, creating the embodiment of fear, stealing all of this weaponry, wanting Grimm involved, getting the White Fang involved, and for what? Like, you're going to end up killing everybody, destroying the city, moving on to the next one place, doing the same there and the same there until there's nothing left, and then what do you have to show for it? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if this is like a revenge plan or if, you know, someone did Cinder dirty or, or something, you know, and what Mercury and Emerald are in it for too, like, did Cinder promise them something, are they in this for their own reasons, you know, did they all go through some really tough hardships and now they're taking it out on, you know, the huntsmen and huntresses and the schools and all this stuff, I don't know, and it's really, it's really itching my brain to want to find out more, and that's the best thing about Ruby, you know what I mean? We get to dissect everything and know what we know, but we can only speculate on what is yet to be revealed. And there's a lot more to this volume, but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, they did mention also the the two other huntsmen at the other academies, and I completely <laughs> I completely forgot about them. So hopefully now that they were kind of mentioned in a more of a, a broader sense, I guess um, that you know these huntsmen, you know these other two headmasters are also in alignment with keeping the peace and order amongst all of the kingdoms. Hopefully we'll see them in future volumes. If not this volume, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, and then Ozpin mentioned too, like, you know, we have to find a guardian, someone who can give the people comfort, but also be able to handle whatever comes our way. Because an army, an army is just going to cause more of a stir. It's going to cause more worry and panic as to what we're going up against. So, um, 
I have a speculation. I feel it's one of three people. Maybe two, but three. Penny, and she's kind of like the oddball out, so she's not one of the two that I really think it might be. Penny, because obviously she was created to deal with situations of saving the world and, you know, all of that stuff with Ironwood and stuff like that. And Ironwood's there and Penny's there, so maybe that's going to lead into something of Penny, you know, being put to work. But the two people that I think at the end of the day have the best chance of being a quote-unquote guardian is Ruby or Pyrrha. Now, I say Pyrrha because, well, Ruby probably for obvious reasons, she's the main character in some sense of the show. She has a lot more ahead of her in terms of her destiny, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, Ozpin has plans for her, letting her in the school early, all this stuff. But I say Pyrrha because she's kind of like the star student. She's kind of like the embodiment of the perfect warrior, the perfect huntress. You know, she has impeccable fighting capabilities and, you know, she's very eloquent and she's able, I feel like she'd be able to give people, you know, and she's renowned too. So if anything, if she, her being a guardian will definitely set people's minds at ease of knowing that they have someone like Pierre to protect them or whatever. And then Ruby is the other case, like I mentioned before, I feel like she has the capability. She has that relationship with Ozpin where he depends on her for certain things, you know, like in volume two and such, like I've mentioned in the past. But between them two, don't really know what guardian you'd be able to find. I can't pick out of anybody that we know of. So those two are the only ones that really ring a bell to me. And then at the very end, we see that Cinder, Cinder is rigging the tournament. I don't know for how long. I don't know if, like, since, like, if she pit the Ruby up against Arburn, if she pit Juniper up against Bronze, etc., etc., but from what we saw, Emerald and Mercury are going up against Yatsuhashi and Coco via a tablet hacking that uh, Cinder got into. Now, I'm assuming, so my theory might be wrong, but I'm assuming that that was the virus that she put in the CCT in Volume 2 to, she's like, okay, she, she has a lot of foresight for this too. She's like, okay, the tournament's coming to Beacon, and they're going to be using their, you know, their technology and stuff like that to resonate to the other kingdoms and the, and the, 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 the Coliseum as a whole. So let me hack into this system. Let me be able to match up who I want to match up. And, but then again, I'm thinking, I'm like, what's the point of that? It's a tournament. But then I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, from all these teams, all these fights, people have been getting fodderized. Team Arburn got destroyed by Yang. Team Bronze got 4v1'd by, by, by Nora to where uh, Port was like, can you go check and make sure they're okay? And then Team, um, Team Indigo got electrocuted. And to a point where their aura levels to a low point. So it's like, I'm wondering if... Or even if killing is allowed in this tournament, which I don't think it would be because that'd be really barbaric. But I'm wondering if from from this, from this all this fighting that they're doing, from these teams that are losing and the other teams who are progressing, if they're going to be treated, if they're like going to be in the infirmary. And I'm wondering if she's putting Coco and Velvet, I'm, I'm sorry, Coco and Yatsuhashi against Emerald and Mercury as a contingency of like, I remember these guys from Volume 2. And I remember when the Grim were getting in the way that these were the reinforcements, these were the backups. So if I send Emerald and Mercury to badly beat these two, like, mortally wound or, or beat them to the point where they're going to be out of commission for a while, then when my plans happen, they won't be there for reinforcements. And I think that's what's happening. I think they're slowly but surely chipping off the competition, and once it gets into, like, the, fi the, you know, the finalists, like the final eight or whatever... Uh, of the tournament, that's when their plans are going to go through, and then when they need reinforcements, when they need huntsmen to help, these huntsmen are not going to be able to help because they're getting beaten to a pulp in the tournament. That's the only thing I can think of, because why would you want Mercury and Emerald to go up against these two? The only thing that you're going to do is advance to the next round and have a better chance of winning a, a fucking trophy, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. I really... I really don't know what Cinder's plans are, and it's like so infuriating to know that I don't know it, but... <sighs> not as concise as a review as I wanted, uh, and the last little bit of information is, her tablet was kind of scrolling through the different teams, and I kind of snipped uh, who's going to be in the doubles, we have Sun and Neptune from Team Sun, Russell Thrush and Skylark from Team Cardinal, we got Penny and her teammate, which we've never seen her before, so we got a new girl there, and then obviously Weiss and Yang, uh, Emerald and Mercury, Velvet and Yatsuhashi, so... Um, in terms of further teams, I don't know if there's any other teams that we haven't seen that are in there, but from Beacon, everyone from Beacon's team that we know so far is participating, so 
that's my review. That's everything that I took from it. I hope you guys enjoyed. hope you guys watched long enough to reach this point. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, but yeah, so this episode had a lot of information, a lot of things to take in, and I'm really looking forward to the next episode. The next episode I'm going to react to is a World of Remnant, the second World of Remnant. Uh, I don't know what it's on. I got to look it up and download it, but uh, I will be back for you guys for that. Thank you guys for watching. Leave all of your thoughts of what you thought about this video yourself, what you guys thought about the episode, my reactions, anything that I mentioned in the comments, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Take care.